Hi everyone, welcome to the Tutor Med channel once again, where everything medicine is simplified. We are continuing with our series on how to spot chest pain of cardiac origin. And we've been focusing on the ischemic cardiac diseases. So far, we have looked at the presentation of stable angina pectoris and acute coronary syndrome. Today's video will feature visuspastic angina, microvascular angina, and aortic stenosis. Let's get started. And please don't forget to like our video, share the link, and subscribe to our channel. So we begin with the visuspastic angina, which was formerly called Prince Metal Angina or Variant Angina. In patients who are predisposed to having this condition, they have a focal or diffuse spasm of their coronary artery, and this results in severe obstruction in that the spasm occludes over 80 to 90 percent of the artery's diameter, meaning only 10 percent of the lumen is available for perfusion, and this results in significant myocardial ischemia. This diagram I got from online illustrates the coronary artery spasm and you can see how severe it is resulting in significant myocardial ischemia it is important to be aware that many of these patients may have a significant fixed obstruction of at least one major coronary artery and this is caused by atherosclerosis and often the spasms occur at these atherosclerotic points even though they can occur in angiographically normal vessels. It is also worth mentioning that patients who have visuspastic angina are typically younger than those with chest pain from coronary artery disease, from stable angina and from unstable or acute coronary syndrome. Yes. And so how will the visuspastic angina presentation be? For demography, we have a younger male or female. The younger here means that compared to the patients who have chest pain from coronary artery disease, these patients are relatively younger. And then the presenting complaint, they will come presenting with chest pain. For the history of presenting complaint, we begin with the characteristics of the presenting complaint. And as established earlier, ischemic heart diseases share similar characteristics. And so the most important thing is to note their distinguishing features. And so, visuspastic angina is somewhat similar to acute coronary syndrome in that the pain even occurs at rest, that is rest pain. But in contrast to acute coronary syndrome, the pain is not acute as is found in ACS but it's typically episodic, occurs in episodes, like in stable angina. Again, it promptly responds to nitrates, just like the pain of stable angina. Then, sometimes, the pain can be triggered by a lot of factors, including migraine therapy, like triptans. So you give someone suman triptan for migraine, if he is predisposed to getting visuspastic angina, he would have it. Then sometimes abuse of or use of recreational drugs such as cocaine and marijuana. And also sometimes giving drugs which would augment the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. Those drugs are called sympathomimetics. Like ephedrine based drugs can also trigger the pain of visuspastic angina. Then we come to the undirect questioning. So regarding the cause of the presenting complaints, we need the symptoms and the risk factors. But here, the symptoms have already been established in the history of presenting complaints. And so we go to the risk factors. Some of them include significant cigarette smoking, again, recreational drug abuse like cocaine, marijuana, and sometimes visuspastic angina has a genetic predisposition. So we ask for family history of a similar presentation. 
then as usual, you come to the complications of the presenting complaint. Here, vesospastic angina sometimes can lead to arrhythmias, and so you want to ask about palpitations, syncope, etc. Alright guys, so on this slide, we want to look at a diagnostic criteria used to make a definitive or suspected diagnosis of vesospastic angina. Here the criteria is COVADIS criteria. COVADIS stands for Coronary Vesomotor Disorders International Study. It is a complex criteria, but in its simplest form, the parameters are nitrate responsive angina during a spontaneous episode. We designate that as A plus a transient ischemic ECG changes during the spontaneous episode. That is B and the third criteria, coronary artery spasm criteria for field. To speak more about the third criteria, we have a transient subtotal or total occlusion which is more than 90% with the angina and ischemic ECG changes which was either brought on spontaneously or in response to a provocation. The provocation here is that sometimes we give acetylcholine or egot to bring about the coronary artery spasm. So these are the three criteria. Now we make a definitive diagnosis of coron uh, sorry, vessel spastic angina. If a nitrate responsive angina is present with either B or C, and then we make a suspected diagnosis of vesospastic angina. If we have A present, but B is equivocal, we don't really know whether it is present or not. And then C or C is also equivocal. So if you have just A present and equivocal B and C, then you can make a diagnosis of a suspected vesospastic angina. Now with vesospastic angina done, let's turn to microvascular angina. It is also known as cardiac syndrome X and this is how the presentation will be like. For demography, we have a younger patient, male or female, but this is very common in the female patients. The presenting complaint, they will come with chest discomfort. Then the history of presenting complaints. If you look at the characteristics of the presenting complaints, you find out that they are similar to coronary artery disease-related angina pectoris, a stable one. They have a chronic or recurrent episodes of exertional chest discomfort, just like in stable angina. However, the duration of the discomfort is relatively longer. Remember we said in stable angina, it lasts for about two to five minutes. But in microvascular angina, these episodes last longer. Now let's look at aortic stenosis. So typically, a patients are asymptomatic. Even with severe obstruction, they may be fine. The classical clinical manifestations of severe aortic stenosis are a triad known as SAD, S for syncope, A for angina, and then D for dyspnea on exertion, which is typically from heart failure. Among the triad, the most common symptom is dyspnea on exertion. Patients with severe aortic stenosis don't typically present with angina, but if present, this angina looks like stable angina pectoris. It is typically exertional. It is, however, important to note that the SAD symptoms are very non-specific. So the physical exam often provides the first clue to suspecting aortic stenosis. The most common cause of aortic stenosis is aortic sclerosis, which is actually a degenerative disease of the valve. But in developing countries like Ghana, rheumatic fever is a common cause and so it is important to find out whether the patient had rheumatic fever in the past. Alright everyone, now let's look at the physical exam findings which would make us suspect aortic stenosis. The three most useful findings of significant aortic stenosis are 
a carotid pulse which has a reduced volume and slow rising, known as pulsus parvus etardus. Now, because of the stenosis or the obstruction, the carotid pulse volume will be weak or small. That is called parvus. And it will be late, tardus, relative to the ventricular contraction. When the ventricle contracts, it takes time before you feel it in the carotid artery. That is the meaning. And this lateness can be appreciated by spontaneously palpating the apex and then the carotid pulse. And you find out that the apex comes earlier than what you feel in the carotid artery. Now remember that the heart sound too is formed by the closure of the pulmonic valve and then aortic valve. And so a single second heart sound is suggestive of aortic stenosis. In fact, the presence of a normal split S2 is the most reliable finding to exclude severe aortic stenosis in the adult. Once you can hear a normal split S2, aortic stenosis is unlikely. And the third finding is an ejection systolic murmur. This is typically heard in the base of the heart, specifically in the aortic area. Other findings include a normal first heart sound and then a fourth heart sound. The fourth heart sound is as a result of a left atrium, which is contracting against a stiff left ventricle. The left ventricle is stiff because its outflow is obstructed. Alright everyone, our take home summary. Point number one, vasospastic and microvascular angina patients are typically younger than coronary artery disease related angina patients. Number two, because the ischemic heart diseases share similar characteristics, only keep the distinguishing features of the major conditions in mind. Point number three, the Covardis criteria is a diagnostic criteria for vasospastic angina. Point number four, always remember that the symptoms of aortic stenosis or severe aortic stenosis are non-specific and so physical exam gives the first clue to diagnose or for diagnosing severe aortic stenosis. And then the last point, Physiological splitting of the second heart sound is the most reliable finding to exclude aortic stenosis as a cause of chest pain in the adult patients.